Hello, thank you all for coming. I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Justin McDon McDaniel. Professor McDaniel, who is the founder and executive director of the Thai Digital Mon Monastery Project, enjoys a professorial appointment in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, a department that he also chairs. Before arriving at Penn, Professor McDaniel taught at Ohio University and the University of California, Riverside. He has earned graduate degrees from Harvard Divinity School and from Harvard's Department of Sanskrit and Indian Studies. When Professor McDaniel arrived in graduate school, he had already spent years as a teacher in refugee camps in Thailand and Laos. And during some of his period of teaching in Thailand, he did so as a Buddhist monk. This is experience that Professor McDaniel has brought to his prize-winning teaching and similarly prize-winning research. This research has been supported by a number of funding organizations, including among others, the NEH, the Mellon, Rockefeller and Luce Foundations, the Fulbright Commission and the SSRC. He is the author of three published books and the editor of yet others. Remarkably, his first two books won prizes. Their titles alone would encourage anyone to read them. The first is Gathering Leaves and Lifting Words, which is more than matched by the second, The Lovelorn Ghost and the Magic Monk. Not surprisingly, given the range and creativity of his research projects, Professor McDaniel has received a Guggenheim Fellowship. It's not clear to me that he ever sleeps, but please join me in welcoming him today. Thank you. That, that's very, very sweet. Very sweet. Uh, the check will be next Tuesday. Um, I'll send over. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just. Uh, uh, knocked off a thing off of my, I have a really boring bucking li bucket list, like I never want to climb a mountain. I think that's, I don't know why people do that. And I never want to like swim a channel and I never want to run with bulls and, uh, but, so, but like, like number six is like Prairie Lights Bookstore. So <laughs> click that right off. So that, that, was, that was nice. Reviewing my bucket list, it's super depressing. Um, Today, I'm going to talk about uh, manuscripts and manuscripts uh, in a very different um, context from uh, Professor Solomon. Uh, going to be talking about Southeast Asia, um, uh, uh, Southeast Asian manuscripts, primarily Siamese manuscripts from the 17th through 19th century, some in the 20th century. I'll talk about palm leaf manuscripts a little bit older than that, say 15th century in Laos and Thailand, just to give you a little bit of background. But uh, I'm really actually talking about how manuscripts travel and how they're collected and how they're cataloged um, and how they move. And um, I have a really uh, easy and, and awesome job. Um, and I'm very fortunate. And because uh, there's a lots of Siamese manuscripts spread throughout the world, and I go and catalog them. And so I get to go to places like next week, I'll go back to Ireland, I go often to catalog there, and I'll be in Italy, in the Vatican in um, uh, April again. And so these are, at least they're fun places to go, and, and um, I, I get to see great manuscripts and great places. And I'll be talking about a few of those places uh, next week. And so if anybody ever tells you that manuscript studies is boring, it's because they make it boring. It's, it can be made very, can be made very interesting, as you saw from this morning, um, a real, a real craft. Um, so, let's let's move on. Give a little bit of background. So, I'm not going to go over this too much, but we, uh, Professor Solomon, looked at palm leaf manuscripts uh, today. Um, mentioned these. Uh, this is the vast majority of manuscripts in Southeast Asia are palm leaves. Um, generally, they. And so they uh, come in two basic types. Uh, Palmyra is the ones that are used primarily in Thailand, in Laos, and Cambodia. Um, and then the Talipot is mostly in Sri Lanka. Um, and so there's not a whole lot of difference between them except for really the size, the size of the tree and how they're, how they're prepared. Um, in South Asia, you'll find them often soaked in salt water and then um, dyed with turmeric powder um, before they're prepared. You generally don't find that in Southeast Asia, um, but there's, that's just a technical thing. But they're really great pieces of technology 
um, really great to, to write on. I wanted to show a few slides of actually modern production of palm leaf. Um, when I was a monk, my abbot was kind of a hard ass, and um, he, um, as abbots often are, and he made us all, we had to like knit our own belts and make our own, you know, palm leaf and stuff like that. It was all kind of just, you should know how to do these skills. I was personally lousy at it. Uh, my handwriting or hand etching was, was where it's very bad, but at least we learned how to do it. And this is part of a, a workshop that I was part uh, in Laos that I, I helped run um, about helping collect manuscripts from different households so we could digitize them and then return them to the houses. Um, and then if people wanted to store them at a library, we, we got funding to um, help build a library and then um, also train people how to, how to do them. And so, and especially train young novices um, how to do this craft. Many of them had, had lost this. And so this is palm leaf, brand new palm leaf being, being produced. And you can see how it's being copied from one, run, run leaf to another. And, um, and I'll show you a couple. Uh, these, are, these are old ones, these aren't, aren't new ones, but th those are new ones. And how, um, how in a sense uh, clean they are and how beautiful they are and how you know, well they hold up under um, when you incise them. And what is uh, interesting, in, if you don't know much about palm leaf manuscripts, is that this one, even though you don't see any writing on it, has already been written. So he's already written two, two lines there. But because you're inscribing into, into the leaf, but if you look closely, um, it still looks like ink, but there's you know, absolutely no ink, ink on there. And so, for example, this is a manuscript from, it's probably about 1770, okay? And so um, this was uh, uh, given to me. And you, when you look at palm leaf closely, like, smell that. Smell my manuscript. <laughs> so, uh, and so, so this has been sitting, so this was given to me by my abbot. Anybody want to see anybody smell it? So it's got, a, it's got a very, you know, distinct smell because it absorbs incense over time in monasteries. But all of the people who just smelled that also sucked in uh, ashes of dead bodies because, um, so thank you, now you have ancient diseases. Um, and it's, and when they repeal Obamacare, it won't be covered. Um, so, so, you know, we're all screwed. But, um, the ash that goes into the groove. So you inscribe it, and then you put the ash over it, and then you seal it. And at the workshop tomorrow, we're, uh, we're going to get a lot more um, instruction on this. Um, but you put ash on it. And the ash, not all the time, not all the time, but a good amount of the time is from the cremation pyres of monks and nuns. And so because well, that's the best type of ash. They've chanted, they've gained merit, so why not put that into your text? So these texts, in a sense, are, have human bodies uh, in them. Um, actually, about six months ago, eight months ago, I actually handled, there's a few books in the United States that are made out of human flesh. Um, there was a, a, you've probably heard about this physician who they discovered that he was actually using cadavers to make the covers of his uh, books. And so now we have two examples of, of a human-made uh, human text. And then these are uh, produced in this way. And that's, that's a brand new manuscript. And, you know, it's hard to tell manuscripts age in some way by the eye. Like, that that's a brand new manuscript. And this is over 180 years old, this manuscript. And there's not a whole lot of difference. I mean, if you just eyeball them, it'd be hard to tell, right? That this was, a, this was a different text, and so this is a medical text. And so that they hold up very well, um, they don't fade. Um, the problem is, there's a few problems, which I'll talk about uh, palm leaf before I get to the main, main text of illuminated manuscripts. There's a few problems um, uh, that they're tasty, um, that mice like them, and so that insects and mice will eat these manuscripts. Um, I actually, my abbot even showed me, he goes, why don't you just eat, he gave me a part of the a palm leaf, and why don't you eat it, like, and chew on it. And it is actually quite, quite sweet and, and, and very nice to the taste, so you can see uh, why it's, a tr it's attractive. Um, also, when you put the holes in it, like we learned this morning from strings, they will wear down. Uh, I was talking to Jim last night, and we were talking about that sticks. The Burmese tend to use sticks, and they, they, they tend to actually hold up much better to put a stick and pull them out. The ropes will rub against the, strings will rub against the side. So there's certain problems, but they do hold up very well. 
the oldest manuscript, palm leaf manuscript we have in Southeast Asia is 1410. Um, and there might not actually have been a whole lot of writing of palm leaf before that. We assumed it was environmental conditions for a long time. Um, but actually, it seems that this is when writing on palm leaf is, of course, older in South Asia, started to rise in Southeast Asia, the idea that you were recorded uh, books for the sake of recording them. And we can talk more about the rituals behind palm leaf soon. So palm leaf manuscripts have problems. Um, and they have benefits. Benefits is that they last a long time. You can stack them very easily. They're portable. They're light. They're easy to make, um, relatively easy to make. Um, and you can, in a sense, there's going to be no fading. Um, and uh, the letters are very distinct because you're you know, cutting them. The problem is, is the contents often, is that and I wrote about this uh, a lot, that you have manuscripts, you rarely have, like we learned this morning, a whole text. So this idea is like, oh, this is, and you get a title for it, this is the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, or this is you know, the 380th Jataka, or this is the Vasanta, or something. That's, that's rare that you say, you have a, you'll have a title that way, but it really won't be the whole text. You have a lot of texts that begin and Lao people call this yok sap. They will begin with a Pali passage, sometimes um, a lengthy one. Things like uh, Vohara manuscripts, they're called, are very lengthy passages, maybe like two leaves. And then you'll have vernacular after that. But there'll be, most catalogers will look at it and they will say, oh, we'll read it in Pali. They'll flip to the colophon, they'll get the date. Pali manuscript, this title, boom, this date, and they're done. You have to actually go through the manuscript to see what is actually there. And the vernacular commentary, sometimes it's lengthy, sometimes it's a gloss, word by word gloss, kam da kam, it's called, um, that you're doing one, one poly word at a time, is that the vernacular is not just a translation or not just a summary. They go off into wildly different subjects. And this happens in sermons all over Southeast Asia. I remember when I had to give my first sermon, I really prepared for it, and it was going to be brilliant, and I was going to do all these things. And the villagers came, and they were just bored to tears. They just like, hated it, right? And it, I'm telling you, this was an awesome sermon. I mean, it really was. I brought it, right? I, I grew up in Catholic schools. I now had a homily, right? And, like, and there was like, man, crickets, right? I mean, or, you know, cicadas. Right? And like nothing. And then I say. Like, well, maybe I should watch. And I asked my ab, and he's like, oh, no. I'd like to say it was good, but it was awful. Um, <laughs> and, but you know, keep going. And, uh, and, but I started watching other sermons a whole lot more and paying attention to them. And that the content, in a sense, the content matters. But I was actually really trying to do what a Catholic homily does. Take a piece of scripture. And that's a bit difference between a homily and a sermon, right? Take a piece of scripture and actually analyze and offer a commentary to it, right? That's almost never done. What has happens is you take a passage, that, a poly passage that most people have no idea what it means. Sometimes even, actually most of the time, the monk or nun reading it has no idea what it means. Okay? They can sound it out. And then they're going to talk whatever they want it to talk about, that that passage had nothing to do with. Now, that happened to Catholic homilies too, right? I mean, my <laughs> Monsignor um, uh, Ted, uh, who I grew up with, Monsignor Ted would, for some reason, he could relate anything in like the Gospel of Luke to the Philadelphia Eagles. I mean, it's like he could manage to get football into anything. But um, this happens all the time, but also happens in texts, is that they want to say something, and they l sometimes loosely connect it. And if they're doing a word, they'll translate that word or gloss that word sometimes, and then they'll go into other, other subjects. So this is a problem. How do we catalog this text? How do we label a text like that? And there's many different types. Nisia, Namasat, uh, Vohara, what's called Wohan in local language. Then you not only have that problem, you have the way the texts are bound. And so, for example, this is a single puk. Okay? So a puk is just a local word for about 22 to 24 leaves. Okay? There isn't a standard for this. And, but that's pretty close to that every time. And this puk oftentimes will be on a subject. Okay? It will be either a whole polytext, it will be a gloss, it will be a summary, um, it will be a ritual text. And it, but it will have some coherence to it. But this is a rare to get manuscripts like this. You, know, this, you, know, that you often get manuscripts, and I have very, very large ones, 
Um, but there are more like this size, and some you'll get about that tall. That's, that gets about the limit. Right? And that this, for example, this manuscript, you can even see it on the side, a slightly different coloring, things like this. This is also an example is that this used to be lacquered with gold, and so people will cut the gold off and melt it down. So that happens a lot. Um, is that this text is actually five different texts. But when it was cataloged, it was cataloged as what was on the first leaf, but then the colophon from the last leaf. So the dating and the title had, had nothing to do with each other. And so I thought this was random a, a lot. I just thought, oh, okay, they're conserving wood, even though this is not, this is not expensive or things like that, but, or it was a nice cover. But really what it is, um, is that oftentimes these bound things, sometimes they're bound together where they're just random and they find a cover and they're just trying to clean up the library for you know, the senior monk coming in. That, that, we find that a lot. But more often than not, what we find is that there's a, there's, it makes sense to have these texts bound together if you think of a mobile monks, is that they have to go do a, a ritual, they have to go do a training. And so we often have, times have grammar, a polygrammar text, astrology text, medical texts and then some sort of story text often go together and it's because that's the whole like like we're having a workshop this weekend that would be the whole workshop is that you're going to determine somebody's good time for marriage you, so you need to know their birth date you need to look that up or you're going to a funeral and you need to you know prepare the ritual for the funeral and protect the thing but you also need grammar because to write yantras and I'll look at this more, more later yantra texts um, which anybody in South Asian tradition knows what these are, kind of powerful, kind of protective, um, uh, coded uh, language, um, is that grammar text is actually how you draw these. And so you would say you break down a poly word and then you split it into syllables, not according to actually poly grammar, but according to these local grammars. And you break that up and then you move the letters all around and they make this kind of mathematical uh, equivalency, which is used for writing on the side of animals or the side of houses and things like this. And so you have texts, narrative text, philosophical text, grammatical text, medical text that go together often to help perform a sermon. And if you think about it, if you're walking a great distance or on a horse or an elephant, it's easier just to carry one or two you know, of these that, that'll cover you for that trip that you are making. Also you find we have like Florilegia in Europe, you have, or Crestomathies, things like this, you have texts that are brought together that will cover sermons around the subject. So kind of uh, quotes and famous passages from different texts that are brought together to do a series of sermons. But that makes it very, very hard to collect these things, to catalog these things, to label these things. Um, there's actually a famous story from, I don't know if it's famous, like three of us know it, but um, it's famous among us three, uh, from 1683 in northern Thailand near the Burmese border of a young monk. And he, this story really illustrates this problem. Thank goodness this was recorded. This is one of the only stories that we have of like the social life of texts um, from that time. And this monk was a terrible, he was a novice, he was like 14 years old, terrible novice. And um, he would sleep and he would take naps and he was always late for things and that he was, uh, his robes were never folded right when he went on alms rounds and all the other monks complained about him. And they, all the other monks wanted to kind of get rid of them, right? And so they went to the abbot and they said, Abbot, we feel that we need to be challenged in our studies, so we'd like a test, right? And so the abbot goes, of course, give me a test. And all the monks studied, and they knew this one novice wouldn't study at all, right? And they did very, very well. I was like, you did well. You know the text uh, um, pretty well. And uh, then he goes to the, to the lazy novice, and um, he goes, you know, you're, you're, you couldn't clearly answer any of these questions. I'm not even going to give you the test. And he goes, um, um, and I'm going to punish you, but I'm going to make you clean up the library. And he goes into the library, and that library is still there, this very small library, about a quarter size of this room. And he took all of the manuscripts, and he took the covers off them, and he scattered the leaves all over the room. So they're everywhere. And he said, we'll see if you can just even put them back together. And he put them back together and amazingly, and he was like, oh, he knows all the text extremely well. But that story is told, and I heard, learned that story in, in, and I read it later, in that actual, that monastery where that library is, and the abbot likes to talk about this, this famous story. But when I was cataloging that collection, 
clear, clearly that young monk did not put them back together very well because they were super scattered, and this happens a lot. Um, or I wasn't seeing the logic. Sometimes you can see the logic, but oftentimes you can't. So they can be split up when you don't have things like glue, when you don't have things like scrolls. Obviously, we see problems in that way. When you can separate those leaves, there's problems. Um, n n that's a problem, but also the fact that, as I showed before, you see in this picture, it's still an active tradition. You'll have text, palm leaf is still being made today, not very often, but it's still being made today. Um, but it was also pretty active up until the 1940s, 1950s. And so that you have an extended tradition and you have no standardization. So you'll have within the same region the same polytext in many, many different forms. And you'll have different glosses of it, and different translations of it. So we find oftentimes in catalogs that says, this place is 81 copies of the Dhammapada. I mean, the second you see that, you just know that's absolutely ludicrous. They do not. And I, I almost can guarantee, actually, I think I can, no, I can't fully guarantee, but I almost guarantee that there's actually not one Dhammapada in that whole thing. That meaning that just the 423 verses, there's just not. That it's going to be almost always Dhammapada Atakata. It's going to be pr without the verses, generally just parts of the stories. There's going to be a mixture of Pali vernacular um, and then oftentimes a mixture of scripts. And I won't go into scripts because that's really complex. Um, so you have that mixture, and then you have a lot of things that were the title. They had a nice title page for the Dhammapada, and that was a clean-looking thing. So they're like, oh, we'll put that on top of old leaves because it's a nice thing to present to somebody as a gift. And so you'll have these nice leaves, and that was just, again, just that top one that was red or the colophon. And more often than not, we don't have a colophon. So it's a, it's a difficult job. It's a, it's a fun job, though, because you are always, like Professor Solomon, you're always, in a sense, um, finding new things um, and always kind of tracking down mysteries. Now I want to move on to talk about uh, the main subject of the talk today, uh, illuminated manuscripts um, or mulberry paper manuscripts. Now these are mul uh, manuscripts not unique to Southeast Asia, but very, very common. And uh, they, they have other benefits and, and other problems. One benefit is that you can paint them really easily. Palm leaf is lousy to paint. Um, it's, it doesn't hold up. Uh, it doesn't absorb. You really have to etch palm leaf. Right? But you can, and I didn't bring any kind of, uh, I don't travel with like really beautiful illuminated manuscripts. Um, but you can write on mulberry in, in ink, in all different types of ink. I found mulberry manuscripts in ballpoint pen from like the 1960s, 1970s. And so, uh, so there are various right. You can paint on them. You can do drawings on them. And I'll show you lots of examples. That's a cat manuscript, for example, uh, right there. So a manual for, uh, for taking care of cats and also blessings for cats and things like that. We have elephant manuscripts and horse manuscripts and all of these things. So you have these very beautiful in the script. You can really be very clear with it. It's really nice. The problem is you can see, and that's why I brought this one, so much water damage. It, it absorbs moisture. Uh, like crazy, and so they really, really get moldy uh, very quickly. Um, second thing is that um, these are harder to produce. So to produce good mulberry p pages, what happens is that you have um, one text, and they're concertina or libretto, right? And so you have one text that'll have multiple texts in it because they don't want to waste the paper. And so you'll just have, you get to end of one, and somebody will just start another one. Um, they also were used to practice uh, for monks and nuns. And so you have a lot of kind of practice paintings, practice drawings. And so you're getting, you're getting problems uh, with this. They're not bound with other texts uh, uh, generally, but um, they're, filled, they're filled up. Another problem with a mulberry paper manuscript is, um, well, two things, tourism and funerals. Uh, pretty things attract rich people, right? Pretty things also attract poor people, but poor people can't get the pretty things, and rich people can get the pretty things, right? And so they go out and they find the pretty things, especially if they don't read the languages. And so they want a painting with a little bit of text, right? It's kind of like hipster tattoos, right? Is that you, you want the kind of foreign looking script, right? Um, and maybe something pretty. But you don't want to really go into the whole thing about it, right? You don't want to go into the meaning about it or things like that. And then you'll just make up a meaning. It means strength or loyalty or something, right? And so 
that you, and it's people wanted these things. And so what they did was they sliced off the illuminated sections, the leaves, and they put them in frames. And dealer, local dealers found that out very quickly. It was so much more money could be made on ripping a manuscript apart and selling all of the separate pieces than it is to keep it together. And so don't do this. Don't buy leaves of manuscripts. Yeah. That's also done in the West. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Oh, that's not all. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was actually given a gift of a Turkish, a page from a Turkish Quran, right? And it was beautiful in a frame, and people were like, you like old books? And I'm like, oh. You know what I mean? Like, like, I love you, I love you, and world cultures, and yes, but no, right? right? And then, like, you couldn't say that to their face. You had to take them to the bar and really, like, slowly explain it to them. Because they were so crestfallen, you know, and he was like, no, please don't. But it was a good sentiment. Another thing is funerals. Mulberry manuscripts and palm leaf manuscripts are produced for funerals. That is the most common time to produce a manuscript. You produce it for the merit of the funeral, and you give it out kind of like as gifts. This is the co most common way books are still published in Thailand and Laos today. You have a whole funerary volume industry. The National Library of Thailand, they used to have a section, they've changed, they've kind of redone it, but they used to have a section called cremation volume section. But the thing is, there's so many things from cremation volumes that they, it was a category that didn't work anymore. It just got too big because half the books in the library were originally cremation volumes. Little biography of the person and then their favorite text. We find this with manuscripts all the time, and I'll show you specific examples. These were made for specific people for specific reasons. However, they don't have anything to do with the act, often don't have anything to do with the actual funeral. It's that they're not chanted at their funeral, that read at the funeral, and the illumination, the paintings, and the stories don't have anything to do with the person. These just become the, like, oh, this person died, I'd love to get them a Pratmalai manuscript because it's beautiful paintings, and, it's a, and the story's not important, but it's a beautiful manuscript, and it's a nice gift. So, and that's the same thing with modern cremation volumes. It's, the text has really nothing to do with the person's life. It often has to do with the giver's life. If that giver really liked a modern Thai poet, then they'll make a new edition. There's no plagiarism laws, there's no like, copyright laws that really follow these things, is that they can just say, I want to produce this new set of poetry or new, a new edition of this poetry and just put your name on the front of it as a gift. And it's a nice gift. So we have that. And then because of funerals, that you have the ones given at gifts, but then you also have the ones that are appropriate for funerals, and that is Abhidhamma manuscripts. So you'll have massive catalogs. So we'll just say Abhidhamma, 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 over and over and over and over and over again. And by looking at the catalogs, you'll say, wow, Laos and Thais and Burmese love the Abhidhamma. I've actually you know, read that. Oh, man. Such as the philosophical, the deep philosophical tradition of the Theravadan peoples, right? And it's just not. It's a, these are not Abhidhamma texts. They are called Abhidhamma Jekgampi, and I'll get to what that means. So seven sections of the Abhidhamma. And it is not seven sections of Abhidhamma, meaning the seven volumes. It is, like uh, Professor Solomon is talking about, it is either an introduction, just a few lines, and of each of the seven texts that is ceremonially chanted at a funeral, but oftentimes not even chanted, just given. Okay. Abhidhamma is chanted at funerals, by the way, but generally not from, people don't read the text generally. Um, and I performed many, many funerals at a monk's, and this is what we would chant. And we'd often hold the manuscripts, but never actually look at them. And most of us could not read the script either, because they're old scripts, either Khmer script or Lana script. And so even if we did look down at them, the vast majority of us were not trained in, in these texts, including my Abhidhamma. So. so you have these for presentation, and the Abhidhamma is used for protective reasons. The content doesn't matter at all. It is that this text pre prepares and protects the body and prepares it for the next passage. And so that when we look at these texts, we will say, oh, this is what the people were reading and thinking about. That's absolutely not, not true, right? Um, if you do that, if you bring that logic to many libraries, it often doesn't work. So if you go to Laos right now, to the National Library, if you just counted the number of books in the catalog, the main obsession with Lao people are Russian language textbooks on chemistry. Okay? That is the biggest collection of the volume. 
Why? Because the Soviets dumped textbooks on Laos. You will almost never have a Lao person that can read the Russian or study these textbooks. It's just this was part of a program of donation. And so they have massive, massive volumes of these. And so 500, 600 years from now, I say, there's going to be the Russian period of Lao history people will talk about. Um, and I'm not going to be there to laugh. Um, so we have problems with these texts. There's a few big collections of illuminated manuscripts. Copenhagen is mostly uh, uh, illuminated, Mulberry and Palm. Copenhagen is a pretty good collection. Otani is a superb collection. Um, Paris, very difficult uh, um, collection to use. They've moved around in the repairs to, uh, uh, to the old library. Oxford's got a, uh, uh, a beautiful and well, well, uh, well, a very small collection, but very nice one. British Library is excellent. And Harvard's got a very chaotic and not well-managed system at all. Um, they just, they don't, they, they just don't manage it. But they're, they're large, meaning when I say large, anywhere from 50 to 100 manuscripts. So this is not massive, massive amounts of text. Okay. Most important ones, though, and these, so, uh, these have been partially cataloged, and I've worked through um, some of the bigger ones. The Otani collection was really professionally cataloged several years ago, um, is these, the small collections. And this is where you're really finding fascinating um, connections between collectors, um, art dealers, and, and artists throughout Southeast Asia. Princeton's got only 18 manuscripts, but they have a set of manuscripts that, that's not found in Southeast Asia anymore, and so um, that was, was brought there. Uh, Nagoya, I'll talk about Nagoya below, and especially the, the famous monastery, the Nitaiji. Free Library of Philadelphia, I'm from Philadelphia, so I will promote my city, the oldest public library in the world. Not just, not just the United States, in the world, the idea of a public library. Still called the Free Library. Um, very large. Walter's Art Museum in Baltimore. If you've never been there, please, it's amazing. Um, Vatican has got a small collection, but um, those Jesuits knew what they were doing. Um, University of Pennsylvania is, uh, is, uh, is, is good. Chester Beatty Library, I'll talk about a little later. New York Public Library, this is a photo of the New York Public Library. Largely, they kept the time manuscripts, 52 of them there, are split up into two rooms. I haven't exactly figured out why yet, um, and they don't have anybody there that works on them, but um, largely in, in the sections on photography, historical photography, that they keep these manuscripts in, so it's kind of, kind of odd. But that's a good example of a very beautiful illuminated manuscript, 26 feet long, so it's a very long table. Um, entire back of it is an entire uh, map of the uh, uh, levels of heaven and uh, 31 levels of heaven, sometimes 33, and then levels, 16 levels of hell. So absolutely spectacular manuscript. And the content is Abhidhamma, the sections of the uh, Abhidhamma. Oriental Institute in Naples is, is um, a very nice a little library too um, for illuminate manuscripts. So problems in working with these manuscripts both big collections and small collections. Uh, I just give you an example of a catalog entry. When I, got, when I went to the University of Pennsylvania and I, and I, and I got the job, of course, you know, early on, I wanted to um, you know, go and see, see what was in uh, the collections. And so this is one of the examples read. Unidentified Buddhist, question mark, uh, Pali or Thai, Lao script, Palm leaves with lacquered and gilded wood covers, tine cord and marking stick wrapped in yellow and purple woven fabric or strips of bamboo, cataloged by Garrett, okay? Or collected by Garrett, uh, Robert Garrett. The beginning is completely wrong. It's not Buddhist, okay? Um, it's, it's not Pali or Thai, okay? It's Shan, okay? It's not in the Lao script, okay? It's in a Thai Lu script from the Yunnan province, okay? That it is palm leaves. And the rest is that you could see what catalogers did. That they, they did what they could. You can't blame this 1929. You can't blame that they marked that really, really well. So in a sense, they kept it. And this was counted as, we've cataloged this. We've moved on. Right? And so when you search for that, you're generally not searching for, and which I advise my students nowadays, search for lacquer. Okay? Search for this woven. Search for things with, with um, binding cords. You use those keywords, you're going to find interesting things. If you search for Buddhism or Thai or Lao, you're going to miss a ton because a lot of the Thai ones are actually labeled Chinese, I was talking last night, Chinese question mark, right? And it's because they were getting so many things in collections and they didn't know where to get them. Uh, yesterday, 
uh, I was at the airport in Chicago and I got an email saying that there's a, a person in Philadelphia who wants to donate three Burmese manuscripts. Can you take a look at these photos? And it's just, we get at least 10, in the last eight years I've been there, at least 10 manuscripts a year, people wanting to give us collectors from all over the world, they just want to give manuscripts. And so that we don't know what to do with them, and so we have to go out and see them. And oftentimes what they tell us on the phone, and that's why we ask for pictures now, or they tell us in emails, is generally as inaccurate um, as this. But sometimes you find real, real gems. Um, when you look at Mulberry manuscripts, you have to, from Southeast Asia, you have to, in a sense, maintain a kind of a nexus in your mind, and I'll talk about this nexus if we have time later. You have, a, you have scripts, you have language, you have genre, um, you have conventions of writing. For example, European numbering became very popular in the 1860s, so you start to see that. It's a very easy way to date things, is that you would find people uh, putting a little number on them. Before that was used, used alphabet. Uh, you, you numbered them by using an alphabet. Um, you see that texts are used all over the time, so it's not just you say, okay, I've identified the pigment, I've, or pigments, I've identified the paper, I've identified the script, I've identified the language, all of these things, and you're checking off your boxes to do this stuff. But then, you identified that, that pigment that was used in the, in the script, but then you have to trace that manuscript as it evolves over time, because these manuscripts were used over and over and over again. And we find manuscripts from Thailand with actually modern whiteout because the monks and nuns are still using them, and they're correcting them, and they're adding things, or they're putting, because a lot of them didn't have tone marks, and so they're adding tone marks to make them easier to, to read, and so it changes over time. And then you have corrections with red pen, with blue pen, um, and so sometimes you even have stickers. I've, I found ones with like little stickers, you know, with little writing on them, like, you know, like post-it notes. Okay. Um, from monasteries that are kept in, so when do you date that manuscript? I mean, I think you should not just date it at the moment of the creation, but it keeps being added to. And we have this, of course, in every manuscript tradition. This is part of the beauty of studying manuscripts, but also the frustration. Colophons, you assume in a sense a colophon comes when the manuscript's completed. But again, if it's a palm leaf manuscript, there's a problem with that because it's whatever text and there might be multiple colophons in it. But with a mulberry paper, if they have pages at the end, they're going to wait to have that used by somebody else. And so they're not going to often put a colophon. And then when the colophon goes last, it's often the time when it's given as a gift 80 years later. OK, I'm, now I'm giving it as a gift, so I'm marking that date. And so we have a lot of manuscripts from like 1885 that looks old. Everything else tells us older. But the colophon says, so we have to believe the colophon. No, you don't have to believe the colophon, because that colophon could have come at the, when the person was giving gift. And I am prepared this, and this is the date I prepared it. But the colophons are very formulaic often, so they're not going to give the details of this. Other times, monks and nuns want to claim that this is a text that they wrote, which they didn't. So they find it in their manuscript collection or in their library of the monastery, and they put their own name on it. Or oftentimes, they're not completely a desert, they put their name of their teacher. So they're honoring their teacher. And so in a sense, they're building up their own ego because they're attributing a lot to their teacher. And then they say, oh, look what I discovered. Well, that's great. And then people all get excited and they say, this is rough. And then also there's the sales of these things. Another problem is that we assume, and Fred Stallman was talking about this, and I, and I think it's, it's so hard to say assume because it matters what context you're in, is that if you grew up in a Western tradition of reading codexes and you were a child and you read ch children's book with pictures and, and text, right, or gra you read graphic novels or something there, right, is that the text and the image are reinforcing each other. They might tell a slightly different story. Um, there's lots of different you know, approaches to how you do a graphic novel. Do you want the images to tell the story? Do you want the images to just you know, serve the text or vice versa? But you assume that those things go together. You cannot assume that in Southeast Asia, in many parts of Asia, is that the images and the text actually almost never go together. The scribes and the artists were working in different, area, in different rooms, often, usually different monasteries. A lot of the illuminators actually weren't at monasteries, they were at courts. And they were experts. And they would be like, well, we have this beautiful manuscript and it's written down the middle. A spectacular manuscript. Abhidhamma manuscript is prepared for this funeral. 
we want the, don the donator, the people who are donating the manuscript said, we would love this artist to do these paintings. I saw my friend had a manuscript produced by them. It's beautiful, do it. They send it over to the painter, or usually three or four people, and they illustrate the text based on what they're good at. So if they're good at flowers, you're going to have a lot of flowers. If they're good at this Jataka story, you're going to have that Jataka story. If they're good at the Prat Malai, they're going to do that. They're not going to be able to read the script. These are almost all calm manuscript scripts, so they're not reading it and referring to anything. And so when you catalog a manuscript and you say this is an Abhidhamma text, first you're wrong. And then you, if you, even if it is an Abhidhamma, just say it was, which it's not, but just say it was, is that you're missing all of that painting. And so you have to label it, and then often you have multiple stories painted that have nothing to do with that text. Too. So it's not just Pratmalai, or not just Vasanta or Jataka, not just Life of the Buddha. Life of the Buddha is actually extremely rare. Um, you have many different scenes, and I'll show examples um, of this. And so these things, um, you can't assume text and image go together. There are benefits to working with these manuscripts. It's not just all kind of frustration. One thing is that they tend to be localized. Okay? Uh, well, actually, I'll talk about them in a second. They, Mulberry manuscripts, because they're pretty and because they were often presented and they often were connected with funerals, is that you get this wide variety of genres. You get things about animals, astrology, um, you'll get legal texts, um, you'll get medical texts with extensive drawings in the medical texts. Okay? You get you know, kind of text on botany. And again, some, usually the text and the image oftentimes doesn't go together. So you have one that's a lot of cats, but nothing in the writing is about the cats. But sometimes they do go together. Okay? So you get a wide variety of subjects. And that, it's great. So it's the vibrancy of a literary culture. Okay? Um, you have, it's difficult to catalog them. They were, the Pullman catalog, you know, was partially useful, but we're, we're really not. Um, but what happens is that these small places, they want to collect these manuscripts and they want to keep them with their other old books. And I never really, really, under, you know, that it's good that they're preserving them. So they're really well preserved. And that's a good thing. But they're not well organized. And so you have um, kind of rare books rooms where boxes have been moved, right? And sometimes, like librarians, like, you know, you have to make boxes, right, for your texts. But sometimes you have a text a box, you have this box that'll fit this text. And you'll put the box in that text. And this must have happened a lot. And then they use an old label. Right? And then you just write a kind of note inside of it that this is just, we're just using this box for storage right now. But if you open up, you'll see a label. But oftentimes, the labels are read on the outside. And so they'll go and say, we have this and this and this. <laughs> and one example was, I went to the uh, free library. And there was a. A Siamese manuscript is said in their catalog, and I'm like, oh, this, this might be the only, I mean, I, mean you, I felt like an archaeologist discovering King Tut. Like, this is, ah, oh, this is going to be great. Walk in there, the box says Siam on it. That's all it says, big, the big green box. I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. Kind of oddly shaped for a time manuscript box, but that's OK. Open it up, Syrian Torah. <laughs> I don't know Syriac, I don't know Hebrew, and I don't know Jack about Torahs, but I know what a Torah looks like. My wife's Jewish. <laughs> I know what they look like, right? The script, and I'm like, that's <laughs> a little librarian who's lovely. And I said, that's a Torah, right? And I can't read it. That's a Torah. And she's like, no, it's not. Sign me. <laughs> and, I, and I went to her, and I go, can we just look both of the manuscripts? She goes, but it's, and I, she goes, OK, you're right. <laughs> like, she just, like, you didn't want to admit it. But this happens a lot, that these texts are collected. But if you don't, how can any library staff experts in all these languages? You just can't. No, no budget's going to ever afford that. You just can't get mad at people. They're doing the best they can, generally. But sometimes there's assumption that no one's ever going to read this or be interested in it. And it's 4.45, and i got to get home, and that box looks nice. You know, and it'll keep safe, and I'll get back to it. But you don't get back to it. The small collections are really interesting, and the big collection is interesting because the big collections they generally do have large collections. They had staff because of colonial powers, um, but over time, especially for illuminated manuscripts, is that a lot of these were being collected between 1860 and 1920, 
And so um, you, I don't know what happened. There are pretty pictures coming. Um, is that this is after kind of a lot of colonial collection, especially the masses that were collected in like 1920s, 1930s. And this is where you had a lot of uh, American travelers and American collectors particularly um, that were flying in because the money at that time was coming out of the mid-Atlantic, New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia. This was the big, big, big money. And so you have lots of collectors that it became a thing among rich people, right, that, oh, they got this and they went to this exotic place and they went on this place and then you got that this. I want those things too. And so you can really trace individual collectors and you'll find most of the stuff. Because not only that, when people heard that these very wealthy people like Doris Duke and, and Christine Harris and Chester Beatty were collecting these things and paying a lot of money for it. Chester Beatty actually put an ad in the, it was not the Times of London, but what would have been the equivalent of the Times of London. They put a, he put a full page ad saying how much he would pay for individual manuscripts. That's nuts. So every collector comes out of the woods saying, oh, I heard you'll pay you know, this much for it. But in a sense, that's good. It was bad for him because he should have been a better negotiator, but he had a lot of money. But it was good because in a sense, these guys became, and women became, magnets for manuscripts. And they had the money, they had the facilities to, in a sense, keep them together. Are we, you think, you just have to restart it, probably? Yeah, okay. um, so they became these magnets for it. Another benefit is that um, they wanted, in a sense, to display these manuscripts, but the wealthier collections, weren't, they, weren't, they didn't need to cut them up and split them up. They could afford to buy the whole manuscript. And so they would, would, um, would uh, display whole manuscripts. And then they would lend them to museums often. And most of the museums and libraries had them is because of lending when people pass away. They're uh, giving these uh, collections of manuscripts. Another benefit is that when the wealthy were buying whole manuscripts, they were buying everything that came with it. They were buying the binding cords, they were buying the wrappers, the boxes, and that's where we're really getting a lot of information. Just really, really wonderful, uh, kind of the, you know, the ephemera around it. Um, and I'll give an example here, is that I was in the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin, and opened one up, one of the boxes, and uh, it's, you know, it was catalog, you know. I mean, I was there to catalog the actual contents, but this was really well uh, covered and protected. And inside the box was a handwritten French translation. I mean, that's, that's, a, we, that's the first translation I think I've ever seen of a divination. I mean, this was, it was just handwritten, and this person put it in the box when they sold, when they, when they, when they, um, when they gave it to um, Chester Bader, where they sold to Chester Bader. They sold the whole thing. And we have lots and lots of things, and we're getting better dating, um, better history of the manuscripts through, through the things that come with the manuscripts. Also, these small collections and these individual collectors, if you trace their lives, which is really interesting to trace them, um, you start to see, in a sense, what you know, some people call kind of the go-betweens of history. The translators, the traders, not the kind of the big men of history. But you start to see all of the people were producing cultures and selling cultures at a kind of a mid-level and were making these connections. For example, I was telling a story last night of uh, Victor Godon. Victor Godon was a naval surgeon from Philadelphia. He, in the 18, late 1820s, he traveled all over the world with the U.S. Uh, Navy. Um, and he just liked collecting things. And he liked collecting things. We, I found out later through reading through all the stuff, in his, and he's buried actually very close to my house in Philadelphia now, that going through all of um, his papers is that he grew up without money. And he actually got his medical degree, medical degree at a public high school, which he used to be able to do. So he went to Central High School in, in, in Philadelphia, and he went to where Barnes and Wistar and Bill Cosby went to, all these people. Um, that he was poor, but he was you know, trained well, or he got trained well. And he wanted to break into high society, but he couldn't break into high society. And the way he broke in was bringing back exotic gifts to break into things like the American Philosophical Society or to get into these men's clubs in the city, is that he could be the exotic friend that you bring along. Right? And so in that way, you find out this really interesting history of this person. And then I'm meeting you know, grandkids now, great grandkids now, who are going through their houses. And it's just wonderful to hear their stories. It's wonderful to hear to see what is collected along with it that you'll see a person has collected things from you know, Saudi Arabia and Japan and Peru 
and that in a sense we need to start writing a history of how people assemble the world and how they represent their their exotic their knowledge of exotic things okay I wanted to go over a few few examples I just want to make sure I'm not too gonna, okay good so um, this is at the Nitaiji in Nagoya and so I was there cataloging or help cataloging the manuscripts I was this is I show this picture because it, it was funny. I'm standing there taking photos, and at the same time I'm taking photos and I'm documenting things that I'm also translating between Thai, English, and Japanese. My Japanese is okay, it was much better then, and my Thai is good, and my English is eh, Philadelphian. And so like, you know, like I'm, I'm working between these things a little bit, and then my Japanese friend, he knew not much English, but he obviously is Japanese. So he would like, when I couldn't find the word in Japanese, he would fill in. So we had this kind of like dance assembly line of language going on in the room. Because they're Thai, they're Japanese, right? <laughs> so this one person goes, <laughs> and he goes, we're here looking at poly manuscripts, and we needed an American to translate and <laughs> document it from all of these different cultures in the room. And it was this kind of weird moment that we were all in, and we were all surrounded by it, and we all like, just had wonders like this is what books do they, they bring us together and it was uh, and these uh, uh, the monks at the Nitaiji um, really had done an amazing job over time uh, protecting these texts if you think Nitaiji if you know Japanese sounds strange you're right it does sound strange because it's not Japanese okay it's Nihon okay for Nippon or Nihon Japan Thai as in Thailand so they put the two words together it used to be called the Nisenji Nippon Siam. Okay. And so it was a temple created. It is the only purely non sectarian temple in all of Japan. Okay. It is not associated with any one group. And so every two years or three years, they get an abbot from a different sect. So you get a Shingon abbot sometimes, and they're just ceremonial. You get a Jodo Shin abbot, you get a Tendai abbot, and they come in and they kind of just represent the place. But it, it's not connected to anything. The temple itself was started. Um, because of a relic of the Buddha, supposedly a relic of the Buddha. And so, going to the famous Koan Otani, um, he went to Thailand to get a piece of a relic of the Buddha. It was found in India in 1898, and to bring it a piece back it was a gift from the king of, of King Jewel Longkorn of Thailand to, uh, to Japan. Um, well, they didn't know what to do with, well, they didn't know what to do with it. They knew it was valuable, and there was kind of fighting like of who was going to get this relic. And just like we have the state of my state capitals, Harrisburg, for some reason, it's like in the middle of the state, because people in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia couldn't agree where the, you know, right? And so where we have Washington, DC, that this idea it was a neutral place. You have to find a neutral place. And Nagoya is about the most neutral place you can go, right? If anybody's ever been to Nagoya, it's great food, a really interesting language, but it is this, it's not the city you go to Japan to see. Right? You go to Kyoto or Osaka or Tokyo, you don't go to Nagoya, which you should, by the way, because it's great, but you don't. So Nagoya was this neutral place between Kyoto and Tokyo. Um, and so they decided, let's build a temple here, and let's call it the Nisenji, and again, renamed in 1941, the Nitaiji, when Thailand changed its name. Yeah. This was also a time where you know, Japan started to have ideas about expanding into Asia, of course. This temple really became the center of Thai or Siamese Japanese contact. And so you had this as like almost like the way station when Thais would get to Japan. They would stay here for a little bit of time and then they would go do other things. This was a friendly place for a Siamese. There's also a very famous Buddha image there that was given. And so Thais went in a sense was part of a pilgrimage of honoring this Buddha image. And this became a wonderful place. And the queen donated manuscripts to it. And then you have had donations still today. I actually brought donations from a Siamese that they wanted to give to the temple today. You even have a statue of King Jewel Longhorn. It's a Japanese temple in a nondescript neighborhood in Nagoya, which is, in a sense, Siamese. And even the trees were brought from Siam, and they tried to maintain them there. So um, you have this fascinating kind of connection to this temple, and the manuscripts they have there are equally fascinating. So this is, for example, a box, a Japanese box made for a Thai manuscript to make it look nice, because the Thai manuscript was brought there, and they put it. I have to say, though, 
that the queen clearly was rushed in preparing for her trip. You know, if you're rushed in preparing for your trip, you forget like two or three things, right? For me, it's always my razor. I almost always forget my razor. Right? She was clearly not prepared for this trip. Or she, at the last minute, her handler said, what are we going to bring as gifts? Or she said to her handlers, most likely, we need to bring gifts, right? These manuscripts were just randomly collected. <laughs> they clearly just went into three monasteries near the palace, and they just picked manuscripts up. There is no rhyme or reason to get, get them. Some are really pretty. All oh, these look nice on the outside, but it's horrible on the inside. Sometimes, in a sense, it was a really kind of nice manuscript like this one. But clearly, look at the gold lacquer. I mean, for God's sakes, that's done as you run into the airport, well, at that time, the ship, right? You know what I mean? Look, they're just like slapping the gold on. And so it's just get as many as we can. It's funny, so Japan that they would take a manuscript like this is like, oh, that's a nice gift, but not to our standards. We're going to make a new box for it. And so the ugly Thai manuscripts have Japanese boxes, but the nice Thai manuscripts don't. Um, they even put plaques on the inside of them so we get a, a lot of um, um, uh, history. Um, so this is where I'm with the team going from uh, manuscript to manuscript and kind of assessing, because there was no record, because they were moving so quick. The Thais had kept no record of what they gave. They just gave it. So we have, we have no idea. All it says in a letter is that she gave gifts. There is not this manuscript, but I think, no, not this one. Well, in any case, it'll be the next one. Um, that we find a plaque on the inside of another box um, that is a fascinating 1931. So this is long after, 30 years after, or 25 some years after the temple has been built, is a new group that is going there. And this is the Boy Scouts of Thailand. Boy Scouts, this is an unwritten history of Asia. Boy Scouts have connected Asia for a long time for the past century. Is that Boy Scout groups are these neutral groups, neutral cultural groups that visit often and they bring with them other things. You often find before big political meetings, like 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, Boy Scout troops have been there about three or six months beforehand in the same group. They have sing songs, they have pictures taken, and it's like, okay, well now we're all friendly, we've kind of assessed each other out, now a political group's coming in, or an official group's coming in. And one of these groups bought a manuscript. And so it was a monk who was leading, a monk, you know, a Buddhist, a Thai Buddhist monk leading a Boy Scout group to not, because count, they put in English, count, he was count, because they didn't write in Thai, so they had to write an English note to them. Um, a count that he wasn't a count of any sort, but that he was the head of the Boy Scout troops in the Goya. He had nothing to do with the temple, but they didn't know what to do with the manuscript, so they brought it over, you know, they, they donated to the manuscript. So you find these little connections of history. Find beautiful manuscripts here. A Prat Malai manuscript is Khmer script. It's Thai and Pali language with a Japanese cover. Where else in the world are you going to find that? There's you put Japanese silk around a palm leaf. And so that the Japanese wanted to make it look, look nice. Yeah. Next example I want to show real quickly is one of my mentors, uh, Hiram Woodward, uh, who's now uh, emeritus at the Walters uh, Museum. Um, and he's been studying elephant manuscripts. And so we have a lot of these elephant manuscripts. And I want to show this because this is an example of where the art and the text do go together. You find manuscripts that are produced not by Buddhist monks at all. They're produced by the royal court. But they're often labeled Buddhist. Okay? And that's fine. In a sense, you can say royal and Buddhist, they overlap a lot. But he's found manuscripts like this. And what's interesting is that, and I, gave, I sent a reading about this, is that you'll have descriptions of actual elephants, okay, that this type of elephant, this type of elephant, these descriptions, and then you'll have mythological ele elephants just put right in, as if there is this, you know, notion that it's all part of the class of elephants, the elephants you can see and not see. And I don't think anybody writing this manuscript believed, I mean, maybe they did, but I doubt it, that you had mythical elephants around, right? But it's that, that that is a class of interest, and what does that tell us about how we classify the world? and that it's crossing borders. This is an example of a manuscript from my own, uh, where I work, um, at University of Pennsylvania. And I wanted to show, as I mentioned before, Abhidhamma, which have nothing to do with the illumination. So it's an Abhidhamma with Pratmalai illustrations. And so, pretty typical Abhidhamma jet piece, seven, seven sections, say, from the Matika of the Abhidhamma. 
And then we have Pratmalai paintings, hell scenes, uh, scenes of um, uh, making merit, uh, going down on the sides. But then we get other paintings. So it's still the Abhidhamma text. But then we start to get strange paintings in it. And not that strange if you get to know manuscripts, but it has nothing to do with the Pratmalai, or maybe it does. And this is one of my favorite paintings. So we have four monks here. This is one of my old teachers used to, um, well, he didn't come up with this term, but he used to talk about this term, uh, Charlie Hallisey. Um, it's a, is the user's manual for the text. You know, is that this text is teaching you how to read this text. This painting is showing you how a manuscript was used. And that's, that's accurate. Four monks are for a funeral. We, would, when we, were, we generally didn't put manuscripts in front of ourselves when we performed funerals, but that does happen, especially in very fancy monasteries. They have very nice stands. We, we just chant it. Okay. And you have people, in a sense, listening to the chanting. But like most funerals, the kids want to do something different. You have people in the back talking on their cell phone. You have people sneaking outside. There's usually a lot of activity. But you usually don't depict that. You depict it as a very formal thing. But this artist depicted these monks as awful. This monk, instead of chanting, right, is re reaching for his tea, which he's not supposed to be doing. Right? This one in the middle is just like, eh, right? right? And then this one's kind of leaning over the edge, and he's kind of like ghostly, like, his, you know, like he's really pale and kind of sickly, but what is he doing? It's kind of creepy the way he's acting. They're supposed to have their heads behind the fan so you don't see them in this section of the chanting, but they don't, right? And so they're sneaking kind of around it. And then in front, you got naked people playing board games. Right? I mean, they're not naked people. They dress that way. But you know what I mean? Like, it's like you usually wouldn't show this very informal scene in front of this. This has nothing to do with the Pratmalai. It has nothing to do with the Abhidhamma. But you can say, OK, the Abhidhamma is chanted at funerals. So maybe it's that. And then you know, I was debating with my students. We kept looking at different paintings like this and saying, well, is this depicting another type of hell? Like, there's many levels of hell. Maybe this is kind of an uh, artistic depiction of what is going on in society as being like hell. I think that's reading into it a little bit much, but could be. Here's another scene, right? You got these two people flirting on, on a monastery within the Sema. So they're within the sacred, okay? but they're just chilling out and flirting, okay, or doing something, right? And then what is the dude doing in the monastery, right? And so I'm like, man, he's taking a nap. And a friend of mine who's a monk said, he's not taking a nap. He's in sexual bliss. I'm like, what? And he goes, oh, that, he goes, that's the sign. I don't know if he's making this up. But he goes, that's the sign. You don't see what's going on inside. And I was like, oh, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> but, but like, why? Like, why is that in the text? But you get paintings like that. If you don't catalog this, how would you ever, ever know? Right? You have a whole social scene that people can talk about. This is uh, another example from the Chester Beatty Library. Pratmalai, very typical Pratmalai, very beautiful ones. Um, scenes of fighting, uh, scenes of heaven, scenes of hell. Uh, Pratmalai uh, uh, visiting the Julamani uh, stupa, uh, very typical scenes. But then as you go on, you have other illustrations coming up. You have almost a manual. And this happens, there's several examples of this type of manuscript. Not this, is, this painting is not found anywhere else. But this type of painting, meditation, meditating on corpses. Okay? This is a Subha Kamatana meditation. It is very well known in Thailand. When I was a monk, we had to do it. They would bring corpses to monasteries, and you have to watch monasteries, I mean, watch uh, uh, corpses decompose in front of you as part of your meditation. So this is, a, this is a strictly Thai, not a strictly Thai practice, but it's a well-known Thai practice. And this manuscript goes through painting after painting after painting, showing different monks doing this, and then showing corpses in different stages of decomposition. And so what is this? Why are these paintings in this text? And, what, and they're in the, so if you just look at the beginning, they're, in, they're about 3 quarters of the way through. Right? And they're spectacular paintings. I mean, they really are very you know, detailed paintings and really well executed. Is, that, is this depicting another type of hell? Is this showing, like, are these modern Pratmalais? Pratmalai was a famous monk who visited, he's like Dante, he visited hells and heavens. Are they showing these monks are like that? Are they reflecting on death, that this manuscript would have been used for a funeral, so they're reflecting on death and the passing of time and impermanence or selflessness? Is it this is the way we will all end up? Okay. Was it a training manual? They show so many different scenes of this. Was this, this way of preparing? Like before I did a Subha Kamatana, 
I had to be a monk for a certain amount of time and then I had to get permission. That you can't just go and do it. You have to get permission to do this because it's, it's, it's kind of horrifying, right? So you have to be prepared. Was this a way, one nun I was talking to, one of my uh, poly teachers, and she was saying, this is kind of preparing monks to do this, preparing nuns by looking at these paintings, if they can handle that. I don't know if that's true, but that this one painting and this one text, and you would never know that from the catalog. This is one of the strangest manuscripts. This is also Chester Beatty Library. And this is just uh, screwed up, this text. So it's labeled in the catalog an agricultural and sports manuscript. That's the label. Um, and my dear teacher, Henry Ginsberg, who passed away, uh, used to be the um, Southeast Asia manuscript rare books person at the British Library. He, he died very young, unfortunately. Um, uh, but he, uh, there's actually, so he didn't read Pali, and his tie wasn't strong, but he was an art historian, right? And so uh, he would often send me pictures from England saying, can you tell me what it says here, this says here, I just wanted to check this and this, and, you know, and, then, and then I would get, I got used to that, I'm not very good at the art history side, so I would often send him pictures of my thing and saying, can you identify this and this and this and this and help me, and it was this nice symbiotic relationship we had. I get a call about a year after his death from, from the British Library. <laughs> and I pick up the phone in my office and it says, are you a Justin that knows Thai? Not hello. Are you a Justin that knows Thai? I go, I am a Justin and I do know Thai. And she's like, oh, you're the fifth Justin I've called. <laughs> And I go, what? Henry, when he had died, he had a cabinet of manuscripts, and all the manuscripts had little labels that said, ask Justin Arrow, ask Justin Arrow. Right? And that's all they said. They were notes for himself. And, and she said this. And I looked at my shelf, and I had a book. It's like a big kind of catalog of paintings, and it had a note in it, just one, that said, ask Henry. And so that it was this idea that, you know, he did this, but he didn't know what to do with this. Sports and agriculture manuscript. And when you look at it, it's kind of accurate. There's a lot of problems with this manuscript. First of all, we have in the beginning of it the name of a monk. You almost never see that. This is clearly an addition, and then something whited out below it. Um, he was maybe whiting out the name of another monk he didn't like. Um, but then it's this half-finished painting here, and then a person smoking opium, truly a Chinese person smoking opium, in a Thai temple. So that, I don't know what's going on there. Then you get the scenes again of the kind of monks behaving badly. These monks clearly don't know what they're doing, right? Then you get a Chinese kind of still life desk set. Okay? Then I guess agriculture, I mean, they're sweeping in a monastery or, I, but I don't know what that is. It's just monks hanging out in a monastery, okay? Then we get agriculture here, right? But in the agriculture scene, if you look up there, there's two people having sex in the field. Okay, like, they're all farming, and then what are those people doing? And why is it in this manuscript, right? And then the hunter, okay, and they're doing, but like, why is this person so angry? I mean, like, I understand work is hard, but like, I mean, do they not feed that guy? Because the other guy looks okay, right? And then you get a Chinese opera scene. Chinese opera, but then the audience, when you look in the, in the audience, this is crazy. This guy's groping this woman, and the kid's trying to get away, but the kid's smelling something terrible. I guess this guy here, because he's drunk. These two guys are like Thai, Muay Thai, kickboxing fighting, right? These two Chinese women, they're kind of looking down on this you know, a person, um, you know, kind of pointing at, with her child, pointing at the opera. But the child clearly doesn't want to pay attention, or maybe that's a doll, but I don't think so, right? Why would this be in this manuscript? It is from no story. And so I've you know, tried to figure this out um, over and, and over. Oh, this is two people having sex in a boat and an alligator about to eat them, that you know, hunter, right? Is that I have a feeling, well, I, I really don't know. But this is one of the manuscripts that Chester Beatty bought for a lot of money and that was sent to him from Thailand. So he didn't see it beforehand. And I think this might have been an elaborate joke on him. Like, we'll just paint anything. Like, some artist was just like, we got a lot of money, just go crazy. And he was just painting daily life scenes and adding his own stuff into it, maybe. You know, or that the collector really liked this scene from this manuscript, this scene from this manuscript, and said, can I have a few of these? Can I have you? Because he was making manuscripts to order. 
And so they're putting a whole kind of like almost like a set of postcards you would buy like if you travel abroad, like I said, you know, from all different scenes of Thailand. Is that doing this? And then the artist was taking all these different scenes of rural Thailand, monastic Thailand, uh, arts and cultural Thailand, but then adding in kind of weird stuff. Or this guy was obsessed with sex, you know what I mean? And he just like wanted to add a sex scene into many different pages. So what is going on here? And do we call this a forgery? I mean, it's not really a forgery, it's original. Is it a fake manuscript? I mean, it wasn't produced for ritual occasions. But it's a fascinating part of history. Oh, and then we got scenes of hell and bodies burning. The Macaulay Pala tree, so, oh, no, 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 that's a hell scene of the lovers climbing up the tree for the rest of their life getting uh, killed. That's, if you don't know that story, I'll tell it later. Um, it's a great story. And um, so all of these things are put in it, it's too much. And then at the end, it was clearly not finished. But it's interesting at the end, what they were trying to do is how the manuscript was produced. You have a monk reading it and then a novice copying it down. So we get this little kind of scene of at the end, this is the, this, there's no colophon. This is the colophon. Is, is, this, is that a snapshot of the, of, the, of the scribe and the painter? Well, not the painter, but the scribe. Yeah. Um, final example I'll use, because I think we're getting close. Yeah, final example I'll use is an uh, example um, that really shows a fascinating history of collection of the Royce family, of the Danbridge Bradley and Elizabeth Royce. Um, uh, I mean, Emily Royce gave it to Elizabeth. Dan Breach Badley is, a, if you know anything about Southeast Asia, is extremely famous. He was the first American surgeon in Southeast Asia. He treated the kings. I mean, this was a really, really big deal. Even Thai, like the oldest Thai medical school, kind of attributes a lot of things to Dan Breach Bradley. By all accounts, this guy was a total ass, like in every way, okay? He married, he wanted to marry his 13-year-old niece in upstate New York but the family thought she was too young, so they made him marry the 15-year-old niece. <laughs> so she is brought to, Emily Royce, she goes on a ship. She'd never been out of Clinton, New York. This poor girl. She has a child right before she leaves with Dan Beach Bradley. That child, of course, dies on the ship. She gets pregnant again on the passage, and the child, no. Then they're attacked by pirates. They don't get killed by the pirates, but several people on the ship get killed by pirates and she loses the second baby. Okay. Then she gets and has three more babies over time in Bangkok, loses two of them. Okay, so this, she had a rough life. And he gets all the fame, but she had a rough life. But she would send a lot of things home. While he was out doing things, she clearly learned Thai. I mean, she was really, really, saying. she died young too, it was impressive. We found a manuscript made for her of how to learn Thai, the first Thai English grammar where she would learn Santa. That was just, she hadn't made it, and she was clear, and she was sound things out, and she was organizing. So she was telling manuscript makers, this is this black Samukhoi man, manuscript, telling them how to organize it. And so we're getting this uh, American grammar book format in a Thai manuscript to study Thai. That form was actually went into later printed manuscripts of how to learn Thai for Thais. <laughs> so she, and it said, there wasn't books to learn Thai by Thais. And she might have been the one who actually started this. But she also produced a lot of, not a lot, but a few uh, Christian texts. So we have the first Bible ever in Thai produced, under, I mean, she didn't write it, but produced under her. So, um, and that actually led to a few others. Okay? And so there was a lot of kind of, she wasn't, Danby Bradley did try to convert people. She, she really didn't. But she was kind of an inspiring figure locally, and people really honored her. And then when she died young, supposedly she had a you know, pretty big funeral um, in Bangkok. And there was a text that, this is in the, the Penn Library, so I stumbled upon this text, that, um, that I'm not sure how it was produced. I'm, I've translated the whole thing, but it's an attempt to write, it seems, a Buddhist story about Jesus. So I'm reading this thing about this healer, and he works on top of the hill, and his name is Prayesu. I'm like, oh, Jesus. Like, that's Jesus in Thai, right? But then, so it's like, okay, maybe this is Sermon on Mount, and then I'm thinking Gospel of Matthew, and looking at these things. But then they bring in all this Buddhist vocabulary. And then how he used grape juice, not wine, but grape juice to heal people. 
And so was this person interpreting these Christian stories that they heard and producing this text that came, that came after her and it was part of her, I think, given to her, and then it ended up being shipped back to New York, Clinton, New York, and they didn't know what to do with it. All her papers there, but these manuscripts, they didn't feel that they could store in this little library in, in Clinton. So it was shipped down to, to Penn at that time. And so I think, I think, well, yeah. And so I just want to, one, this last thing, and maybe we can talk about this more tomorrow, is when we study manuscripts, especially manuscripts, unlike 2,000-year-old ones, where we, we just don't know much. We just, we have, you know, so few fragments. But if you're studying manuscripts that are produced in the time that we do have traveler accounts, at the time that we do have paintings of scene, is that you have to incorporate, I believe, all of this in. And then you also have to incorporate the history of the collectors and the museums and the curators and the librarians in this thing. And I often use, if art historians or anthropologists in the room, they know this very well, I often use Alfred Gell's or Gell's theory of the art nexus, okay? Is that every piece of art has not only the artist, but the artist or the author, you could say, is also the witness to the act of their own creation. And so the text or the painting changes them as they do it. They trust things, they change things, they learn from things. You have the materials and the agency of the materials. Birch bark will do certain things well, but won't do other things. Palm leaf will do certain things well, but not other things. Is that the material itself has agency, and we can look at the many ways it has agency. Pigment has agency, it allows you to do certain things. We can look at the genres and the styles. We can look at the ornament. We can look at the recipients, the collectors. And one thing I'd like to add, in a sense, to Gel's theory, and there's many more you can add, is to bring into this nexus all of the ritual and all of the social relations that go into the making of a manuscript and how the manuscript is used. And I wanted to end on this, is that we have many manuscripts, in a sense, that are ritualized and can't be read. Okay? So, for example, we, this is a manuscript. This is a manuscript, protective manuscript. I have another like this one right here. These are called the good. These are manuscripts, scrolled manuscripts. Once it's sealed, you can't read it. And this one right here is a sealed, completely sealed. And so, you can pass that around. Yeah, and so it's a manuscript that that manuscript will never be read. Right? And that it's the materials used are ritualized. But you also make, like amulets, like the ones I have around my neck, you also, in a sense, make these um, with, with text, is that, that, that amulets, I think I brought, this is a new one, this is a relatively new amulet, it's about 20 years old. Okay. This amulet has man, palm leaf manuscript in it. And so when manuscripts get old, like in a sense, uh, in Gandhar you would bury them, is that you grind them up into paste and they go into the molds for text. And, so, and then you have inscriptions on the back. You have yantras like this warrior shirt. Yeah, so you wear this as a shirt underneath your clothes. You can have this inscribed in the soldiers' uniforms inside of the back of their uniforms. Okay. Um, you have scrolls that are, like my abbot gave me this one, which is three texts rolled in th made in three different types of material, so lead, gold, and copper, and then it's rolled up inside. And this one is not sealed because he gave it to me, but I, I, you know, I keep it in this because it's, I don't want it to lose. But you have all of this text, but not only that, is when you cut the palm leaf, and this is what you don't find in catalogs, anything. When you cut the palm leaf, when you prepare the palm leaf, when you add the ash and all of these things, is that there's a ritual to this. Is that the cutting the palm leaf, you have to chant a certain chant as you, as you cut it. As you dry it, you chant. And so there's a whole oral liturgical history around preparing these manuscripts too, which often doesn't make into this nexus. And I'm trying to figure out, and so I just finished this, um, uh, the NEH I knew was going away, so I had to get money from them. So uh, before, before it's canceled. Um, and then we got money from Luce Foundation. So we got 800 grand, and we cataloged and digitized basically the entire manuscript collection of all of Laos and Northern Thailand. And so me and, and uh, a British scholar, a German scholar, and then a team of scholars in Chiang Mai and Wing Jain and Laos, in Thailand and Laos. And for many years we've been doing this, and we just polished off. So you can go online, say laomanuscripts.net or lanamanuscripts.net, and we have digitized now about 17,000 manuscripts that you can search and do all these things. But what we're doing in our next stage, if we can get more funding, is to film monks making manuscripts, to film them chanting as they cut, so you can see all of those things. So a catalog 
that is in a sense a hypertext that helps you read the text, but also in a sense a ritualized catalog. Um, and then of course in that catalog we put it now, we trace as much as we could about the history of the collections, um, how the texts were used in, in descriptions. And I know I've gone over time, so I'll stop there. Thanks. Justin, I only have about 300 questions, but I'll just stick it to one right now. <laughs> okay. um, and it's maybe a little bit tangential here, but the, it was interesting about Fromalai. Mm -hmm. And um, are these manuscripts in uh, Combe and Khmer uh -huh. and Thai as well? And if so, are these distributed into specifically different collections now in the diaspora? Or, or how, do, how do they do it with these manuscripts in these different scripts and languages? Yeah. That's good. The first is yes, the second is no. Yes, absolutely. Almost any manuscript that we're finding before, um, it's hard, to, about 1840, 1845, um, central Siamese manuscripts on Molipari are going to almost universally be in Calm script, which is a version of Khmer, as you know. And so that, um, and we have, we have one piece of evidence of a guide that was used. You can tell the transition started to come in the 1820s, where monks and nuns couldn't read that calm script anymore because you for the first time get a guide how to read it, right? And so if you're producing a guide, that means it's not common knowledge. And then that really fades away. You still do get some Khmer or calm script manuscripts um, up until the 1920s, 1930s, but I think they're hearkening back. They're just being copied. Um, so yes, they're, and they're, most of them are in a mixture of Pali and Thai. Laos is completely different. They all have very, very few, if any, manus Mulberry manuscripts. I mean, they have some, but very few. It's not a tradition there. Um, and there's almost no calm script in, in Laos, and so, or in northern Thailand. So it is regional. Um, and then in the northern Thailand, Laos, you have, multi, you have eight different scripts that are being used. And in one, I've had one manuscript that is four different scripts in one manuscript. Um, and inscriptions, you'll have two. Well, you have two, the same text with two different scripts on either side. Um, in collectors, no. Collectors are collecting pretty things. Oh, and so, so whatever they could get, right? yeah, whatever they could get. And you, I'm, this is the next step to this, is trying to trace, and there's just almost no records, trying to trace the dealers um, in Thailand. Because we can trace the dealers outside, but who was the dealers inside? We have one identified, and then he's, he's agreed to let me interview him. He lives in Australia now. Supposedly, he was the last great forger of manuscripts, and he fake aged a lot of paper. And he lives in Australia now, and he's like late 80s. And so he was doing that, I guess, in the 60s. He was kind of making fake, I mean, he was making new manuscripts, they're genuine manuscripts, but he was calling them, saying they're from 1820s. He wasn't telling people he was making them. So, um, and I'm hoping that he might be able to connect me. Well, who trained you? Who trained you in painting? And then I'm working with another person who is the great granddaughter of a person who worked in the royal court as a, as a she was an artist. Her, um, and so that's the next stage. But, um, and so if we can trace those collectors in Thailand, who they were selling to, then we'll be able to get a bigger picture. Um, so you've talked a lot about uh, individual manuscripts, mm -hmm. and it seems like each has a very sort of unique identity. Mm -hmm. It gets built up over time. And I'm wondering about uh, the historical transmission of manuscripts, even if they're, it's difficult to, to really say there's a single text that mm -hmm. gets copied. Uh, but in particular, uh, I guess my first question is, is it primarily in monasteries that this sort of thing happens? Mm -hmm. uh, or do you have a secular or lay context for text transmission? Uh, and in monasteries, do they have Geniza practices? Have you seen, uh, you know, whether in your own experience or, or uh, written discussions of, you know, laying down manuscripts that have gotten too old? Mm. Uh, to connect it to Richard's talk, is there any sure. sort of consciousness of, oh, these things get pretty crappy pretty quickly? Mm. Uh, should we try to find a better material? Mm. Uh, I guess all of these questions have to do with the kind of self-conscious drive to copy 
texts oh, that are getting old and need replacements. Okay. Um, that's, those are really they're great questions. So first is that the vast majority of it is going on in monasteries. Okay. And we can identify, but not a lot of monasteries. You know, um, I wrote an article many years ago um, about one monastery in rural northern Thailand that really was this one monastery and this one monk that produced, I mean, upwards of like 20% of all the manuscripts we found. I mean, this place was churning out manuscripts, right? And so, um, and wherever his students went, we find manuscripts coming up later. So he was, you know, um, you know, kind of like a famous chef who runs a restaurant and then the sous chef becomes open up an extra in this restaurant. Like, you mean you can, you know, see that, but the style still remains relatively similar. Um, so we do have cases like that. In Bangkok, in the UTA, we really don't know a lot because it was burnt by the Burmese and most of the manuscripts were stolen or burnt. Uh, but in Bangkok, yes, there's uh, two, well, there's several monasteries, but two ones that were really producing a lot of manuscripts. Um, we know one because of a theft, is that there was a theft one night in the monastery and p the, that the, the thief clearly knew where to go to get manuscripts, right? Um, but also the royal court, that there were were texts coming out of the royal court, and there was paper makers in the royal court because you just had to take notes. Um, like I was saying, we found these uh, battle. I was telling you last night, we found these battle plans that were just of a daily briefing to the king, that were you know sold to a manuscript dealer. So you do have have mostly monasteries, but some royal courts, and then you have stationers. Um, it seems that the stationers and the pigment was largely for illuminate was coming out of Chinatown. And uh, which is right next to the Grand Palace in Bangkok. And so a lot of this, the materials were actually being produced there. And you have a huge shift in the 19th century um, as Chinatown grew, the number of colors that were available. And you can date manuscripts, like before about 1830, there's only four colors really in manuscripts, and then it explodes. Okay. Um, and, uh, but the tools to make the manuscripts were not being produced in Chinatown, which is, it's, that seems, that was actually seemed to be produced coming out of the, this large Sanskrit training center called the, uh, which was a, like the Royal Hindu Temple. But that I'm still working on. Um, so those things. In terms of manuscripts, how you retire a manuscript, or how you lay it down, you generally don't, you can't destroy a manuscript, right? You can't throw it away, but you can use it again and again and again. Okay, so you can use the end leaves, I mean the end pages to, of mulberries to add more stuff. You can use it as practice. Um, you can take the manuscript apart and make it into amulets. Um, when you, uh, like when we would, um, and this is very common, um, conduct funerals, is that we would take a piece, we had kind of this one manuscript we used, right? It was an old manuscript. And we would take bits of the end of that leaf and we would actually write in pen on the end leaf. So, and we will write chi uh, ru ni, which is uh, four kind of parts of the Abhidhamma, right? And we would just write those syllables and we put it in the mouth of the corpse before we set it on fire. And so as it, and this was very common, we, it wasn't just us doing this, um, that as the body burns, it's chanting, in a sense. And so you do that, you put manuscripts inside of Buddhist uh, statues, but not as we find in China, where there's a chamber in the back that you put scrolls in and things like that, is that you actually grind them down into it's like dust almost, and you put them in the head with a bag of relics. The relics usually go under the Usnisha. So um, the top you know, flame, flame you see on Buddha images in Southeast Asia. And so you have lots and lots of practices. But putting manuscripts with, because you don't bury, you wouldn't burn a manuscript with a body, like a whole manuscript. We have one painting um, of, a, of a skeleton with a manuscript laid on top of it in a manuscript. So it's a manuscript painting with a manuscript on top of a skeleton. But I believe that that was just for the Asupakamatana ritual and then it was taken away. Because you don't, the bodies you use to meditate on are bodies that have died young. So they died suicide or an accident or murder or something like that or execution. Um, and those bodies can't be cremated because they'll release bad things. And so those are the bodies that decompose. So you wouldn't ever see a manuscript on top of a corpse that you would burn, right? Um, and then, oh, in terms of the historical, did I, wait, historical tracing of manuscripts? Yeah, okay. transmission. Trans I mean, is there a drive to you know, ensure that old manuscripts are replaced with new ones? Oh, yes, but not, but not in the sense of that we're preserving the text. Oh, okay. 
yeah, oh, absolutely not. That this text, if we don't copy it, it will disappear. No, no, no. It's, um, it's much more creative, much more dynamic than that. There's no sense of 100,000 times you copy this, you will get some, you know, enter nirvana, none of that. Um, that this is, texts are good to produce, but it's extremely independent and extremely dependent on the abbot. Um, for palm leaf. I mean, it's really, really, it's very hard to find standards, um, which makes it really frustrating but really exciting. Um, you do have a sense of um, that a job of a monk is to copy manuscripts, but what they're assigned. We don't, we find monasteries that are dedicated to like medical texts, we find monasteries that are dedicated to as, as, as astrology and things like this, or autosatic, you know, kind of predictions, uh, uh, prognostication. But we actually don't find monasteries that are dedicated to like the Abhidhamma or the Vinaya, like that you have to keep producing, that if this monastery doesn't produce these texts, it'll die out. Um, and there is, for example, in the country of Laos, not one single copy of manuscript or non-manuscript form of the Pali Canon. I mean, that'd be like going to Poland and not having a copy of, like, the New Testament. Right. I mean, there's no, I mean, so there clearly was not a drive of completion of a canon, that this was a thing you did. Certain monasteries, certain people, certain, got, used, got good at certain texts. And generally, it was seen to be for a lot of practical purposes. Um, and Vinaya, the Patimoka is obviously practical. Dhammapada Atikata, Jataka Atikata. A lot of grammatical text, which I argue I think is largely because of protective magic. Um, so yeah, you find certain traditions, but also it's not a faithful copying either. And there's no effort to do a faithful copying. I mean, you know, clearly this is just a little mistake. This is you're consciously, you know, when you have five mistakes in one page, this is clearly not. You're not just stupid, right? I mean, maybe you're really stupid, but um, I don't, I don't let abide by the stupid scribe syndrome. Like, when in doubt, it must be a stupid scribe. I think that's an e too easy of an answer. Um, so, yeah. Richard Okay. Uh, thanks, Justin. Lots of interesting stuff. And like Fred, I have many questions, but I'll just try okay. one. I, I'm interested, this is a little self-serving, uh, at, at some point early on, you showed uh, a, a book and you said this is about the maximum size. And I was curious because in some of the Pamian manuscripts mm. that I showed, the Pamian palm mm. leaf, some of them have very large folio numbers. Uh, if I remember, there was one that was like 530 or Ooh, something. Wow. <laughs> so, but you know, we just have uh, yeah. a few folios from that manuscript. So I'm trying to imagine how that was actually preserved, a, right. a manuscript that had literally s several hundreds or conceivably even thousands of mm -hmm. folios. I'm just wondering from your experience, do you have any intuition as to how those would actually be bound and stored and used? The only thing, I mean, the, uh, the largest manuscript I've seen in two pieces of wood, and this was a night, I mean, lacquer, very nice, was about that high. And so we're talking about 300 leaves, okay? Um, you go to Sri Lanka, of course, in Kandy, you're seeing the Mahavamsa, you're seeing ones that are about that big, and so really beautifully produced, right? I have never seen them anything but laid down, like, like I'm doing now. Like, because you can't stack it. It's like a giant sandwich. It's gonna fall it down, right? Is that you have to lay it down. Um, the ones that I've seen, and I have no idea, but the, the bigger ones, like this big, um, they are wrapped in the, uh, um, the asana, so the seat, you know, of the, so seat of forest monks. So it's a piece of large square cloth that monks sit on in the forest. And this is a traditional way of wrapping these bigger ones because they're big enough to do it. So I've seen it that there's one monastery, and it's very controversy, that wraps it in women's skirts, which is seen as something that it can make them more powerful, but also more dangerous, right? And so, um, but I've only seen them laid down. But the, it's so common that they're so unwieldy, as you know, is that it's so much easier just to break them down into, you know, sizes like this. You know, first of all, you can hold it. Um, and, and, but yeah, it's, I wish I had a better answer for you, but it's, it's just, that's where the technology and it starts, starts to fail, right? That a codex will keep something very large and, and these just won't. I'm surprised you 500, that's, that's massive, so. Yeah, probably more. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the single hole and the double hole, uh -huh. is there 
Oh, well, Southeast Asia is almost completely double hole. Almost where India, you have that single seen. hole where yeah. you can almost fan it. Yeah. yeah. You, and you I noticed that really. looking at the edges of the holes, were those burned? Were you burning the holes? No, we didn't burn the holes, but I've seen that black, yeah. so that I think that was a, mm -hmm. you know, to cauterize it in mm -hmm. a sense, right? Um, yeah. But no, we, we didn't. It was cut, and I think it would have been better if they, they were. Um, but sometimes you paint it around it, like you find in Indian manuscripts, the red, you know, the red hole, like you paint around it, but yeah. um, that's even pretty rare. Um, and I mean, that's, the strings are the biggest problem. I mean, strings and mice. Yeah, because you just, yeah, exactly, you're just sawing into the side of it, and that's where the splits start to happen. Um, but yeah, the, uh, I don't, that's, that's strange. I don't know why it's not burned more, and because it would maybe, I don't know, that's a good question. I think we're, we're going to take a coffee break. Thank oh, our speaker, okay. Justin McDaniel, and we'll, we'll uh, reconvene at 3 o'clock. Thank you very much.